technology. So it's so super exciting to have you with us, Pilar. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. Okay. Uh, uh, ooh, we're getting some people saying uh, that they can't hear anything in the chat. Um, I guess, Bindu, is that true or are we okay? Audio is bad, no sound, we cannot hear. I can hear you, we're good. I think we're good. Yeah, it's fine. We can hear Great. you. Great, I'm now getting lots of people saying they're fine. Okay, uh, <laughs> chats have spoken. Uh, anyway, uh, okay, so I think, you know, what we're talking about, we're talking about the you know, future of AI, um, and also, you know, maybe maybe transformer models. We can talk about how that fits into the current and the future of AI and that sort of thing. But let's maybe start with the the, the here and now of AI. So, I guess, Pilar, what what excites you most at the moment in all of AI? What's what's cool? What's happening? What's going on right now? Well, I'm a little biased towards my field, right? So, mm -hmm. as you mentioned before, I work in conversational AI. And uh, I'm very excited about the latest breakthroughs. I mean, the last five years, let's say, have been uh, so amazing. And there has been such an acceleration of breakthroughs and, and new technologies uh, making huge progress towards a much more conversational uh, dialogue that is really exciting. Uh, right now, there is a, a lot of effort um, around the world, I would say, both in the scientific community as well as in corporations, to basically leash <laughs> these uh, new technologies that are generating this, this great conversations, but we're still, you know, challenging. It's still challenging to control. So I think that once we are able to do more, better, and at production level with this kind of technologies. Is, is gonna be yet a new disruption at so many levels in different fields because conversational AI is so horizontal to almost anything that you can think of that I think the impact will be enormous. Indeed. So yeah, let, I mean, you mentioned there've been some breakthroughs in the last five years or so. Can you, can you give us a little flavor of um, what, what, can we, what can we do that we couldn't do before or like what new uh, benchmarks have we reached? Well, um, I think that the, the latest breakthroughs, in my opinion, started with the launch of BERT, the first of the Transformers, and everything has been rolling after that with new Transformers that have been bigger and more powerful and have been doing more and more things, right? So initially, it was just uh, about language. Now it's language and images, multimodality, multiple languages, and it gets more and more exciting as we move along. In terms of the conversation, it's very interesting to see how the past was more based on very structured and controlled conversations that were not very conversational, not very flexible, but were usually precise, at least when you could, most of the times you could understand the main cases and actually be very deterministic <laughs> in that sense. And now we've gone completely the other way. It's not very controllable, but it's very conversational. So we've got fewer full flexibility. Um, it sounds very human-like, it sounds great, but we cannot quite control or ground it to the degree that we would like to. Mm -hmm. So I think that the, the future is somewhere in the middle where we have full conversational capabilities, flexibility, mixed initiative, the kind of conversations that we would really like to have um, but also control about the direction of the conversation and all the safety and responsible AI matters around that, grounding factuality and, and all those things. Yeah, I just had to, I was just looking that up in the background myself, I had to remind myself that yes, BERT is, is, is more recent than it feels. Uh, as a, <laughs> that was published in 2018, I think. Uh, yeah, 1817, I think it was, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, that's, um, wow, uh, time is moving slowly, I think. Uh, but uh, um, well, maybe it's worth mentioning. You know, what was um, what was the breakthrough of um, of BERT or similar models? Like, why you know, why did they why why did they you know why did they sort of suddenly unlock so much? Like, what what was the the secret behind them? I don't know that there was a secret, but I think that the concept in itself <laughs> is, is, is revolutionary, right? Having 
large pre-trained models that you can use uh, just a little bit more data to adapt to whatever it is that you're trying to do. It was very revolutionary um, at the time and now it seems to be the path that we're all taking. Um, I think that the tendency has been to be bigger and bigger and bigger models, the more data, the better. And we have, you know, billions of, of parameters in the, in the last models that have been launched. But now I think that the tendency is to explore, okay, we have this amazing, super large models. How can we reduce them? How can we curate the data to a degree where we have something smaller than it was before, but that still keeps the same performance? And I think that's going to give us great insight into the quality of the data and the impact that it has. And we'll get to a point where we'll be able to optimize to a degree where we know exactly how much data we need to get in order to achieve what performance in what type of domains. Because it's not all the same, obviously. Not all domains, not all the domains require the same type of data as not all kinds of applications will do. But I think now we're now in that super exciting moment where some models are growing, some models are shrinking, we're trying to find a, a nice point in between and, and adding new modalities and, and new ways of looking at that. Mm -hmm. no, that's, a, I mean, that's an important point because I think, uh, you know, these, as these models get larger and larger, it's um, sort of potentially fewer and fewer companies, actors get to play with these models um do, we, do you think that's sort of a, a trend that's going to continue or is the sort of the push to keep things uh to try and then shrink the data shrink the models are these forces going to balance do you have a sense of that well i think that with like with anything in, in any research area i would say that you just try to accomplish a goal in you set less few work constraints in order to accomplish that goal and in order to get where we wanted to be we've just been throwing data at it right it's like okay data is the fuel let's just throw data at it and that's why we've been uh, creating bigger and bigger models uh taking advantage of of the new technologies that will allow us to process uh, data at that level, right? The multi-bot technologies and so on. But now that we've reached a certain level of flexibility and we're going into numbers and make it almost unmanageable in the sense of bringing these models to production and also very expensive, um, you know, human uh, motivation <laughs> is very important in finding new paths and being resourceful. So. You know, this is unsustainable. You cannot just continue to throw data at it and, and throw more and more resources indefinitely. So there has to be a path to at least reproduce the same results that you have in a much more optimized way. Mm -hmm. And that's the way it's always been, even with computation, right? We all have in mind the examples about the huge computers that they had initially and how, you know, our phones today can do more than those computers ever could in a tiny little pocket <laughs> this ice uh, kind of computer right um so i think it's the same with the large language models we've been okay. going in a direction where we have the room size computer <laughs> that's where we are right now and we're looking to see how we make it more into more compacted models that that can be used in in different ways and can be accessed by more companies more researchers everybody pretty much right indeed and I think we're, um, I think we're seeing that in the uh, in the, uh, the text to image models. Uh, I've, uh, you know, we've, we've had an explosion, explosion of new models there. So it's sort of like the headlines this year was Dali, Imagine. Um, I, I feel like were there not two? Uh, there were two text -to image models from broadly Google this year. Am I right? There was Imagine. There was another system. I forget the name. Um, um the one that comes to mind for me is imaging i don't recall the other one we did okay. uh, launch palm and palm was a multi-model i could to be... do many things not immediate but <laughs> okay, i think i think i know where i'm getting my facts from but yeah so i guess so, so dali and imagine were the big ones which uh um so it was interest you know it was interesting to see the sort of different strategies so so open ai releasing it by sort of initially a very small closed beta um uh, Google just telling the world, hey, we did it. It's cool. Uh, 
And uh, but I think now you know a few new players entering, and in particular, I think um, um, Stability.ai with Stable Diffusion uh, for, um, have fully open source, potentially quite a, a smaller model. I'm yet to actually try it out. Um, that's it. Sort of. Like, I wonder if you can sort of comment on like these sort of uh, different different paths for. Well, actually, I, I guess it's um, maybe the interesting point here is like you know something like BERT that was quite quickly open source just put into the world. Um, now with these larger, like much larger models, are we going to see the same thing, or does it? Does you know? Do we have to wait until people make them smaller? Do we? Are there con new concerns with these models? Basically, why are we not seeing these uh, models become open source quite so quickly this time? Well, I think that there are different philosophies in terms of responsible AI and safety. And what's become apparent for anybody who is in this field is that these models are not completely safe just yet. So I think that when large companies develop these models, they have a big decision to make. Do we leave them loose in the, <laughs> in the open for anybody to play with that with whatever consequences may come? Or do we wait until we think we are at a stage, more controlled stage where um, the likelihood of something bad being done is at least limited, right? And you can see that there are some companies that are comfortable releasing those models already. And that has some positive, some pros, but also has some cons, right? So mm -hmm. I think that what we will see is that the companies that tend to be more conservative in terms of safety will release models when, when they feel that those constraints are set in place and are safe enough in terms of responsible AI. Mm -hmm. So I think this relates to what you were saying before that potentially the, the latest and greatest systems now, um, it, it maybe in the conversational AI domain, um, they're very conversational, um, but not so easy to control. Can you tell? Can you tell us a little bit more about that? And that potentially relates to the, the safety points and the safety concerns you mentioned. Yes, it's about factuality and it's about control, right? Right now, those conversations or most of this, uh, well, you have some level of, of guidance of, you know, prompting the system to run in a certain direction, the level of control of where the system is going to perform what task and how and when <laughs> and so on is limited. So a lot of the research goes now into how, how can we have these uh, generative models perform specific tasks within specific constraints in a reliable sort of manner. So um, that's part of the challenge of the state of the art today. But mm -hmm. I would also say that there are others like, for instance, factuality, right? Because of the large amount of data that these models are based on, there are, as you very well know, hallucinations in the, you, you, you get responses that may or may not be true <laughs> and you don't know when they are, when they are not true. So um, a lot of the research goes into, well, how can we make sure that we can ground those facts um, either with the models or with pre or post processes? And how can we make sure that there is a certain level of introspection in order to have confidence, you know, be explicit or transparent about how much co how confident you are that what you're saying is accurate. Mm -hmm. So those are very clear challenges and I read that there are tons of people based on the publications and, and the conferences working in these areas right now. Indeed. So uh, a point I or well, something I saw expressed was uh, you know, it's you know it's amazing that some of these large language models you can ask them, you know, what's the you know, capital of England? And they'll happily say London. Um, but you can ask them sort of maybe a nonsensical question and they'll potentially just hallucinate an answer. Um, and or potentially when they don't know. Um, the point I saw expressed was like, you know, are we are we doing it wrong? Like, don't we have databases of uh, you know capital cities and that sort of thing? Um, so I'm just wondering, like, is that is that a way forward here? Like, should these systems be like trying to interact with sort of more classical ways of storing knowledge and information? Um, In my opinion, <laughs> this is my opinion, <laughs> personal opinion. Um, Generative models in the way they are today will not suffice to solve the problems that we have. We'll have to find some hybrid solution where, you know, the facts are facts and they are contained and, and they are, you know, uh, verified, let's say, by reliable sources. 
Um, but also if you move from facts like, for instance, data that you can think of, like what's the highest mountain in the world and make sure that that's accurate and all that, which doesn't change much. Those that change, they could still keep up with like, who's the president of the United States right now? Or who's the tallest man in the world? Hopefully that changes eventually, right? There are things like interaction with specific interfaces and devices and APIs that have to be precise. So if you want these generative models to actually have, not only just have a conversation for the sake of having a conversation that may or may not be true, which could uh -huh. be an entertainment related kind of conversation and it might be fun even if it's not true. Um, but if you want these models to be utilized in context where we want these say entities or agents to be performing tasks on our behalf, they have to interact with backends and those backends have to be interacted with in a deterministic sort of way. So there has to be some way of translating one thing to the other. Clear uh -huh. APIs that allow us to scale the ways this model work um, and connect them to, to the factual world, to call it something. <laughs> indeed, indeed. I think um, the uh, sort of the follow up to this opinion that I saw was also that though that um, potentially these systems like large language models might be quite good as um, at least capturing the knowledge which doesn't sit neatly behind an API or um, sort of in a database. So you know, sort of, you know, knowledge, knowledge that you know this you know here is a computer mouse, but in a pinch I could use it as a hammer, for example. Um, which you're not going to find that in any database. Uh, there's probably no API that tells you that a computer mouse can be used as a hammer. Yeah, hopefully everyone knows this. I, I wonder, like, are there other sort of, is that sort of the promise that these sort of new systems bring us that they can sort of deal with that sort of fuzziness of the world in some ways? I think that there will be new systems that deal with the fuzziness of the world um, to a degree that is still fuzzy, right? Uh, but it's reasonable. I don't think that we can untangle the world, <laughs> make it nice and uniform for us, to, for our convenience. But I think that we can get to a degree of performance and reliability that is useful for the purposes of whatever domains we focus on. I think that's something that is interesting in my, in my opinion, like I'm personally interested in, it, it's in terms of proactivity. Mm -hmm. I think that's one of the critical aspects of conversational systems when you are trying to use those conversational systems for a purpose is for the mm -hmm. system to be proactive in several directions. And you can have, you have a system intent, right? The system intent is not just to cater for whatever the user is saying or trying to do. You might have an intent of your own and that might be educating the user into you know the ways of using a particular the, the interfacing itself or something else or uh, providing information taking advantage of certain situations to inform the user of something that may or may not be of interest for that particular user and using the opportunity to say sell something or you know do cross sales or up sales if you were in that kind of environment mm -hmm. that kind of thing Right. And for as long as we're not able to control that proactivity, still systems will be lacking um, in, in the level of features or capabilities that, that we need to have. Right. So how do we introduce those primary and secondary goals in the system? Not just respond to the user goals, but introduce primary and secondary goals uh, from the system perspective. I think that's a very interesting area. Yeah, are you, are you able to expand on like sort of the how of that area, or is that still sort of the the, the you know, inspirational inspirational ideas phase of things? Uh, as in, how how do, we, how do we guide these systems? Yeah. Well, the how and the technology. So you're going to get me fired if I start talking about <laughs> whatever it is we're doing. Right? That's not the purpose of today. <laughs> Hopefully, I'll still have a job after this conversation. <laughs> okay. All right. But um, I think that in terms of areas of research and in terms of areas um, where we lack control, and it, it's still interesting um, because of the amazing things that we could do once we get to that degree of mm -hmm. control. Uh, those are important. <laughs> the how is for everyone to work out. And to All right, fair enough. Fair <laughs> enough. We'll, we'll, we'll get to we'll get to the everyone's figure out moments. Okay. Um, so I think you know naturally we sort of um, I, you know implicitly we've gravitated towards talking about sort of conversational systems and thus language models. 
Um, but you know, you know, right now I, I used a visual prop uh, in this discussion. Um, and so I want to sort of talk about that. So sort of uh, conversational systems, like currently they're sort of mostly bound to just text, but how's that going to change now in the near term? How are conversational systems oh. going to change? I'm, I'm hinting at multimodality. Um, so, um, oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> not, not hinting well enough. <laughs> um, yes, absolutely. No, I think that multimodality is definitely the future. And I mm -hmm. think that it's limited right now, but we're seeing more and more models and the, uh, the multimodal models that I can think of, for instance, are. Um, it's, it's mom, I think it was released also by Google, I don't remember the year, but uh, probably a couple of years ago. Uh -huh. um, I think that's definitely the future because communication is multimodal inherently. Uh -huh. So as human beings, uh, obviously, um, we demand more. We, we want more. We want, if, if you're looking at something, if you have an interface that is interactive and it's fully multimodal, the experience is superior, especially it for specific types of context and for specific types of devices, you uh -huh. have a screen, you can utilize it. And if you think about the future, for instance, in terms of um, mixed reality and augmented reality and virtual reality, those are incredible tools to create even more than we can experience as normal human beings in the environment. We can go beyond in superhuman kind of experiences, I would say. So I think that's definitely the future, but um, we need to first control at least one of the modalities <laughs> <laughs> and then go fully one time other when we, go, when, when we do that. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. Um, yeah, so I think actually we mentioned, uh, so we, sp we spoke about um, curation of uh, curation of data as um, sort of one of the, maybe the important one of the important steps to get these systems to do what it wants to. Can you can you maybe just elaborate on that? So sort of like what 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 type of curation are we doing, and uh, you know what are we what are we including? What are we removing? Well, um, I'm not particularly familiar with the latest uh, mm -hmm. uh, the latest uh, processes or methodologies in order to clear the data, um, but I think that there is a question about where the data is coming from, right? And when you're just seeking for massive amounts of data, there are limited sources. So you can get very choosy. <laughs> Otherwise, you don't get the amount of data that you want. Um, but the other part is how can you curate that data before or can you pre-select some of those sources? And I think that the work that's being done currently around reducing the size of those models and how, you know, what did you chop off <laughs> in order to maintain the performance, but still um, reduce the model significantly in several orders of magnitude will give us clues in terms of how to start that, how, how to think about data in a different way. What are the sources or how can we do that curation prior to building the model as opposed to having to cut off the model later on? Um, so I think that we will get a lot of clues in there. Um, attribution is also one of the key elements here. So it's not only about whether something is true or not, it's where is the source? Who's the source of that information? How reliable is that source? And is there any controversy around that? Because uh -huh. some truths depend on who is uh, looking or what, what prism are you looking at, at that fact from, right? So there are, uh, unfortunately, well, unfortunately or unfortunately, I don't know, there are truths that, that are that depend <laughs> on the point of view. So those are very interesting challenges. Then if you want to ensure that your models are trustworthy in that sense, you would have to contemplate answers that may not be uh, unequivocally correct, maybe contextual, or maybe a matter of position, or a matter of opinion, or a matter of perspective, and what is the right thing to do? You cannot give a lecture about, okay, when the, you know, these people think that this is true, according to this other theory, people think that this is true. So you have to find ways of being truthful, but at the same time, 
hint or let the user know that there are other potential answers that might also answer that question, right? Mm -hmm. And that has to do with attribution or what sources of information you choose in order to have your models and how you prune that data, how much is contained in that information, how you handle that information. So I think that's in the direction of what you ask. Mm -hmm. Got it. Yeah, so maybe follow up to that. It's, um, so and a lot of these breakthroughs have been the results of people processing you know, truly web scale amounts of data uh, as in, you know, sort of, so they are uh, these huge, huge data sets of just like either just like text from the internet or text image pairs. Um, and so that's, that's been the source. Now we've got models generating content that's getting put on the internet. Uh, what's, what's this going to do? Well, that's just another degree of craziness, isn't it? <laughs> 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 um, I'm particularly excited about synthetic data generation. I think I think it's a great way of accelerating progress and experimentation. And we certainly have several um, projects around that that I think are exciting because they don't just generate data. So this methodologies can allow you to test, to measure, to generate new metrics, to um, unearth perspectives that you might not, might not have been able to before. So there are different ways of seeing um, what this happens, but it's like almost like I, I referred before to other areas of research. The, especially with conversational AI and language technologies um, in AI, and in the world that we live in, where we are all connected, every experiment that we do, every application that we launch, every product that's out there, doesn't just leverage what's out there, it changes a little bit. The perception of AI it changes the data, it changes the interactions, right? So um, I don't know if it's appropriate, but it's almost like the butterfly <laughs> effect to a certain degree. You start throwing things and um, some of these things have effects in the way we human beings use these applications that then change our paradigm of interaction and therefore change the expectations that we have and it might drive us as a society in different directions. So the complexity of what we're doing is enormous and is exponentially growing. And you know we can go back to why are we not releasing necessarily all those models to, in the wild. So then you have one of the answers because <laughs> it's not only about what can be done directly with the models, but the unpredictability of, of the impact that all these interactions will have in the interactions themselves and therefore in the sources that we're using to collect this data and creating this massive snowball that we don't know exactly where we're going. <laughs> so let's just uh, make sure that uh, we don't trigger any ripple effects until we have more control over it, right? Got it. Makes sense. Okay. Um, so I think something sort of implicit in this is that, you know, we're sort of imagining sort of potential usage of EEG sort of conversational or dialogue systems. But um, so I think people will be familiar with some places that these systems are used. But can you tell us a bit more about like some novel areas of application of conversational AI? Um, where do you think that's going? Well, I think that uh, I, I, again, I'm a little biased about what I think. <laughs> Particular areas of applications that I find fascinating have to do with education. I think that there is a natural connection between conversational AI, education, and some other technologies that allow us to analyze, um, like BMI, for instance, um, brain machine interfaces, um, that allow us to predict how well have you learned a concept? So if you have, say, an, a system or an agent that you can have a conversation with, they can teach you, can train you, can test you, can guide you, can provide um, live feedback <laughs> for you to learn something, whether it's something physical or it's something, it's this new skill or, or a new language or something else. And on top of that, you can use technologies to predict whether the concepts that you are trying to um, absorb 
are already uh, well uh, absorbed in your brain or not, and you need more or less practice. I mean, that could be so revolutionary in so many ways because we invest so much time in in informing ourselves, in, in trying mm-hmm. to become better. And this can democratize the access to information as well as help us optimize our interactions and mm-hmm. become better at whatever it is that we're interested to become better. Like it could be skills or it could be anything. So that to me is super interesting. Another area that I think that conversationally I has a huge impact in is the area of having to do with health and medicine and the interfaces here. So in terms of health and medicine, it's not just about diagnosis and treatment, which could be uh, also very revolutionary and help doctors and and personnel in that area significantly, but it's also about everything else that has to do with that. Um, There are certain complexities like dealing with the paperwork or the administrations of insurance with so many different things that are crazy, especially in this country, it's really hard (laughs) to deal with insurance related things that an AI, a conversational AI can just dumb it down for those of us that are not very familiar with the system. I just explain to you what you need to do, when you need to do it, or do it in your behalf if you mm-hmm. can do that. So you don't have to hold that in your brain. It's like you can have a system that optimizes what you need to your advantage, how to leverage um, the coverage of you know, your insurance to make sure that you do it the right things, that you do it on time, that you get the maximum benefits, uh, and you don't you know, miss opportunities in that way. So those are specific areas that I think we can have a lot of impact. To me, a third one comes along that has to do with the services that are complex in other dimensions. I, for instance, doing your taxes. (laughs) I don't know very many people that like doing their taxes. (laughs) I don't know that they exist. (laughs) But let's assume that that's a possibility. But um, again, Just having a conversational entity where you don't need necessarily to know or to have enough expertise, just using natural language to say, this is the data. Hopefully you have an interface that allows you to do that, not manually, but uh, automatically. And you can ask questions and you can tell you these are your options or hopefully tell you this is what we need to do and, uh, and just do it on your behalf without you having to worry about it, right? It's so much time saving, complexity saving, mental bandwidth saving. <laughs> uh-huh. I think that all those applications will be amazing and will make our lives uh, a lot easier. Yeah, no, I, I totally, I totally agree with the uh, the bandwidth saving point there. I've been using, some, <laughs> I've been using a, a Copilot, for example, when writing when writing codes. And even though it's 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 only it's not right all the time, but when it is right. A little bit of bandwidth saved, which it can be a pretty amazing thing. Okay, um, so I think I, I will probably start reading some questions from the audience soon. But in the meantime, I think um, you know, if we're talking about the, the future of AI, um, and as you correctly pointed out, you can't tell me how we're going to do some of these things. Uh, but part of the way, like, how are we going to do it? Well, maybe people on this, uh, people listening right now might be doing it. So my question to you is like, about basically careers in AI, like what are what are people's options? Like if people have been interested by what they've heard here, how do they do that? What are the options open to them? Well, I think that there are so many options right now. Some of them are even more exciting than the others. So uh, there is an explosion of opportunities uh, everywhere in AI. You can get training online on your own without necessarily being regulated. You can join universities online. You can go through Coursera or a number of other things to just get the basics of AI and even um, you know, ad- ad- advance in that direction almost on your own. And then you have regulated programs in a number of universities and so on, pretty much almost anywhere in the world right now. You can have AI programs, right? There are some governments that have AI ministries right now because AI is becoming so important. So what I would advise um, everyone and anyone who's interested in this area is to not think that the only path to AI is through engineering. 
think understanding math and understanding the engineering behind that, behind everything that we do is super important and it's a critical part of what we need to do, but it's not the only one. I think that the future of AI is multidisciplinary and it really needs to include not only diversity in terms of backgrounds, cultures, races, languages, and so on, which it does, but it needs to include different perspectives and many of those perspectives come from the humanities. One of the critical um, concepts that I like for people to think about is that we want to think about AI as a tool that caters for us human beings. And the reality is that the humanities have been studying the complexities of human beings for millennia, <laughs> right? So if we want to define and design a future that caters for our humanity, we need to understand humanity, not necessarily just from an engineering point of view, but from a human point of view. So the future is multidisciplinary. The target, the requirements, the how, the what will make us better as human beings without removing or taking away part of our essence is defined in terms of ethics, is defined in terms of philosophy, anthropology, uh, social sciences, psychology. There are so many different things that are not necessarily precise sciences, uh, exact sciences today, they need to be integrated into how we look into the future of AI that I would encourage pretty much anybody to go in both directions. If you are in the humanities, go and form yourself, like train yourself to understand how, how AI works and understand at least the basics about it. And if you are in the scientific side, think about the humanities side and think about the perspectives and the rich diversity of information and insight that it brings, not only in terms of how we can do AI, but also why we're doing AI and where do we want to go with it, right? Mm -hmm. Got it. Okay, so we've got um, a few questions from the audience which I've just been noting down. Um, so see how many of those we can get through. Um, so one person asks, um, you know, these approaches using massive amounts of data, seems like something's missing, as in our brains, we seem to be learning with much um, smaller amounts of data. Um, can you can you talk about, is, what's, is there a missing piece um, to, to our current systems? Um, how are we thinking about that? Yeah, it depends on who you ask. <laughs> Some people think that it's all about the data and the more you, you know, you throw data at the problem and data will solve everything. I personally think that there is a piece missing that we still haven't worked out and that it's somewhere in, in a hybrid system with using the technologies that we have today that are database, um, but also different types of technologies that will connect those models to the facts, to the grounds, to the different systems and to the other technologies. So we're, we're not there yet. We're still missing pieces. Got it. Okay. Um, specific, specific question about, um, so when we're talking about uh, AI for education, you know, the possibility to really optimize the educational experience. Uh, someone asked about, you know, well, some people have different uh, preferred ways of learning. Um, how does that fit into that story? That's precisely one of the aspects that I was referring to before. I think that through different types of technologies, we can actually detect what are the uh, types of learning that people are better at and optimize those interfaces, methodologies in real time to adapt to those peoples in a very customized and personalized sort of way. So uh, it's really important that we think in terms of diversity in terms of what are the, the types of learning that will help the most and how we can adapt our own methodologies to basically uh, optimize for time and efficiency in those uh, learning experiences. So yeah, uh, that's spot on, I think. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree. Um, and a question just in, uh, so uh, models, 
uh, it seems, uh, tend to reflect and also potentially magnify uh, biases in the data that they're trained on. So especially with these text to image systems, you ask, you know, show me a lawyer, see a man in a suit, and you know, show me a nurse, and it's probably female. Um, can you tell us a little bit about sort of methods to mitigate uh, those types of things? It's, um, it's part of the challenge that we have today. And I guess you very well stated these models because of the data out there is generated by us and we are already biased. I mean, the world is really biased. <laughs> the data that we generate uh, generates, amplifies those biases. So we have to, I think that the first, the first part is detecting the dimensions of those biases. Some mm -hmm. of them are very obvious, like you know, the, the ones that you mentioned. We are, to a certain extent, aware of the bias towards white men versus you know, uh, men of other races or women in general, right? Or we are uh, aware of of bias uh, towards certain uh, languages, dialects, races, you name it. There are so there are so many things, but there are others that are so deeply embedded in what we do, that are pretty much almost undetectable. You don't even realize that they're there. And I think that the first exercise that we can use or take advantage of, of these technologies to do is to unearth those. And not only in order to solve the problem, clearing the data and generate resources that are better than where we are today, but also to help us be more aware of those biases that are already embedded in us. Um, I think that AI can actually help us become better human beings by reflecting with real data and analysis, mm -hmm. things that we might not be aware we're doing and are not aligned even with our values. But if you're blind to that, then there is little you can do. So I think that the first step is identifying the obvious biases and the the ones that are embedded deeply into our behaviors and, and therefore the data behind it to on the one hand solve that, but on the other hand to create awareness and therefore help us be better as a society that's a super cool point okay um well i think we're at, we're at time that's been a been really fascinating to hear about all these sort of uh, amazing things that are happening right now and could be happening in just mere years to come so uh, thank you very much, Bila. Thank you, James. It's been a pleasure. And thank you, Bindo, for inviting me. Um, thank you so much. Enjoy the rest.